Go ahead, jaw, run free. Well, on a leash, anyway. You can pee anywhere you want. This is Papaw's yard. This is family, <laughs> family property. He could probably walk around the neighborhood and no one would care if he was unleashed. They're pretty cool around here. Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said great. I'm doing great. We are gonna kick off the day with, as you saw, Jaw got his walk. My grandpa's gonna treat me to some lunch and then I'm gonna go pick up my buddy, the local legend, Tim Hebb, and we're gonna do some uh, exploring in Springfield, Ohio today. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. I love that on their logo, the referee's shirt is about to bust open. <laughs> Drinking it away. We always come here for the breaded pork tenderloin. Here's our tenderloin and some jalapeno poppers. Papa gets first dibs on the mustard. Serves me right for getting jalapeno poppers. I just squirted the cream cheese all over my shirt, so I'm gonna have to change shirts before I leave. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, we're gonna take off out of Troy. My friend Tim is not gonna come with us. His Wife woke up and she was very sick, so he's gonna help take care of her. We're gonna head off to Springfield together, though, you and I. I used to work there right at that corner restaurant when it was called Taggart's, up here on the square. Hey, there's Kay's Hamburgers, famous. There's some really fascinating history in Springfield. We've done vlogs out here before where I showed you where Jonathan Winters, the comedian, where he grew up where he lived with his grandmother and his parents and John Legend's house and today I'm going to take us to where First Lady of the Cinema Lillian Gish's childhood home was. We're going to go to, to boxer Davey Moore's grave who was memorialized in a Bob Dylan song and an old theater with a really amazing mural. This is crazy. I was just passing by this house. I've never shown this before. This was my old band house. In high school, I had a band called The Secret Sounds. We played tons of gigs, parties and stuff. We recorded all of our music here and rehearsed here in that garage, in various rooms of that house. Watched a lot of 80s movies here too. Had a lot of great times here. This was our pal Tim's house, his parents' house anyway. I'm glad I noticed that when we were coming out here. I mean, I used to come out here all the time for that last year, my senior year mainly but I really like kind of came into my own as a person hanging out with those guys. That was the Yoder house and a lot of great memories there. Listened to a lot of music, had a lot of wacky conversations. We have arrived. We're gonna start over here at an old theater. So this is a rundown theater here in Springfield. It was the Regent Theater, and it was an old vaudeville theater. Before they were talking pictures and before theaters had to be wired for sound, there were vaudeville houses where live performers could come, and a man named Gus Sun was hip to this idea and started opening small theaters. He had seen them in New York, where they would charge people a dollar, so he started opening them in small rural towns and only charged 25 cents and then ended up opening several of these and then realized, oh, I can open a booking company as well and have, you know, performers under my booking company that I can rotate out to different theaters so that it doesn't get stale and they can always be in different towns. So on the back of this, they have a really great mural that pays homage to Gus Sun's business and he, he dealt with everyone from like Bob Hope to the Marx Brothers. So if you go behind the theater where the courtyard Marriott entrances for the hotel on the back they have just this absolutely amazing mural almost too darn big to even fit in camera but Gus Sun himself started out as a juggler so that's him up there his family was in a circus he eventually sold the circus to finance him buying the theaters and then below it you see that 
we'll go on the other side of these little bushes but you see Lillian Gish, Dorothy Gish now showing Orphans of the Storm. Then you also have Louis Shakers, Harry Shakers, and Phil Shakers in the big band. But I love that. That's so cool. Yeah, they were born here. Lillian Gish was the older of the two. Five years later, Dorothy came. She was actually born in Dayton, but their mother was an actress. Their father basically was a, a drinker and abandoned them and took off to Oklahoma where their mother raised them, put them in theater very young. They were making their debut just a couple years old and were getting significant parts by the time they were like seven, eight, nine years old. But their mother would end up taking, you know, various um, theater company jobs. So sometimes they'd be in a different part of Ohio or, or sent somewhere else for a different job for several months, but they would always come back here because they had family all over Ohio. But what they really got their big break, or how they really got their big break, is that they eventually moved to New York, the whole family. They had moved before and started up like a candy business that kept them going for most of the girls' teen years in the uh the tough times but they ended up moving to new york and their next door neighbor was mary pickford before she was mary pickford and she got a contract with dw griffith and then told him about them and he ended up signing both girls on basically as extras and they were they looked so similar that he would have one wear like a red ribbon on set and one a blue so he could tell them apart and then once he started to kind of see their talents, he saw Lillian was quite a, a talent and he started giving her better roles. And then Lillian watched Dorothy one day and saw how good she was and said, why she's almost as good as me. <laughs> so it's crazy to see that, uh, you know, like I said, Lillian Gish actually, she was known as the first woman in the cinema because she was so influential. When they signed with D.W. Griffith, he eventually featured her in Birth of a Nation and Intolerance, which were like groundbreaking films. Now they're pretty much both like canceled because of the racial overtones to the movies. But those are very significant film history and they, they both really got their launch there and then had huge careers. But Lillian was, they said her, the way she performed on film set a standard for other actors and how they should perform and how they should convey on stage and on on the camera so really cool to see that they're memorialized both here let's go over and see where their childhood home was or at least where lillian's childhood home was right here on the side of the building you can still see where it has the original regent name up there the original steps that would have led down the fire escape the old theater doors over here. I love that they put that mural there. Beautiful job. I remember seeing an interview with Vincent Price where he said like the, the crowning jewel of his acting career was that he got to be and perform with both Helen Hayes, the first woman of the stage, and Lillian Gish, the first woman of the cinema. I believe he worked with her in Wales of August. Upon further investigation, the Shakers Brothers actually took over and ran the theater from the 1950s till it closed. So believe it or not, the house still exists. Dorothy and Lillian were in about 100 movies individually and um, many times together. Lillian was known as the first lady of silent cinema and she never liked when the talkies came around. She thought that the miming in movies was its own art and even later on in life, even though she made other movies that were talking and, and you know, did participate in that, like Night of the Hunter and stuff, she would say that fighting later on in life for the preservation of silent movies to make sure that they weren't forgotten. So that was her childhood home.
when the girls had their first audition with D.W. Griffith, he wanted to make sure they could act. And he said, since words mean nothing, ladies, he pulled out a pistol and started firing it around the room to watch their reaction. How crazy, huh? <laughs> Both women, extremely, extremely successful careers. Now we're gonna go see a statue to a famous boxer. So if you come over to a place called The Dome, just as you're driving up the hill, you'll see the Davy Moore statue. Only place I could find a park was around the corner, so if you're coming the opposite way, look for this Welcome to Springfield Center City sign, and then the statue's right over here. I know the last time I was at Dodger Stadium, I mentioned Davy Moore because he actually had his last boxing match there. So here's statue to Davy Moore, featherweight champion of the world. Born and raised here in Springfield. Died resulting from injuries sustained after one of his fights. Here they have a lot of information about him. American boxer professionally from 1953 to 63. He was only 5'2". Dynamo was often referred to as the Springfield Rifle and the Little Giant. Born in Lexington, Kentucky, but raised in Springfield, Davy took to boxing as a young man, eventually became an AAU champion, member of the 1952 U.S. Olympic team, and eventually professional featherweight champion from 1959 to 63. He was close personal friend with Springfield native and world-renowned vibraphonist Johnny Little, also an amateur boxer. On March 21st, 1963, in a nationally televised title fight against Sugar Ramos at the newly opened Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, California, Moore was the two to one favorite to win, but in the 10th round, Ramos unleashed a flurry that sent Moore reeling backwards, eventually falling and whiplashing his neck against the steel ring ropes. Moore's manager waved off the fight after the round finished, with Ramos garnering the title by TKO. Moore participated in the post-fight interview, both at ringside and in his dressing room, but suddenly complained of a severe headache, passed out and slipped into a coma. I know that happened in, the, uh, in his dressing room after the fight. He succumbed four days later and died. Moore finished with a 59 and seven and one boxing record. Moore's death as well as brutality and dangers of boxing were forever immortalized in the music of folk singing legend, Bob Dylan's 1964 song, Who Killed Davy Moore? Yeah, so after that happened, the California Athletic Commission started considering banning boxing licenses and having boxing matches. And Bob Dylan wrote a song and it was basically saying like, Davey Moore, what did he die for? Just for like a brutal fight, for a brutal sport kind of thing. He's buried here in town. They have a park also here in town named after him. Yeah, I have seen the, uh, the post-fight interview from the ring. He's like so, you know, worn out that he's leaning on his knees and on the second rope and he, he says, well, he just had, he just got the better of me tonight. He didn't really even sound like he thought he couldn't win. He actually said he wanted a rematch. Get Davey Moore for me. We're trying to get Davey somehow, some way to get the story of the champion who was a great one for four years. Dave, I know it was a tough one. Uh, what's the well, story? Uh, I just, it just wasn't my night tonight. It wasn't your night tonight. It just wasn't my night. Davey, I'd tell me maybe next time. He'd like to get a return shot. Oh, definitely. He, I don't think he can lick me. You don't think he can lick me? I don't think so. Davey. I can fight much better. What they had surmised was that when his head hit the bottom rope, back of his neck, when that hit the rope, it disconnected his brain stem. This park just so happens to be on Davey Moore Way. And here it is. Just your typical park, ball fields, soccer fields. 
Looks like Davy's buried about five minutes away. We get to cut through this park. Ferncliff Cemetery. There it is. So right behind this patch of bushes, you see a headstone that says more, and Davy is right there. That statue, they dedicated that statue to him. It was the 50th anniversary of the fight, and Sugar Ramos came out because he has felt guilty his whole life. He was there for it, along with Davy's uh, wife, his widow, and she told him that she didn't blame him for it, that it was a freak accident. So, what an amazing record! Over 100 wins and only seven losses. Featherweight champion of the world, and he held that for four years consecutively. After he passed away, of course, I said Bob Dylan wrote a song about him. Phil Oakes wrote a song about him saying that the money men killed him. And even the Pope came out and was talking about how we didn't need to be boxing anymore for financial benefit. But he was first and foremost champion boxer that he was proud of. Only 5'2". That's just amazing to me. Think of what he could have done if he were bigger in the heavyweight division. And that's sad to think that Sugar Ramos felt so guilty for so long. But now he has an eight foot tall statue here in town for everyone to come pay respects to. Also had a uh, really famous fight against Roberto Duran. 30 years old. Whew. Well, my friends, I think we've seen quite a bit of Springfield for the day. If you're, uh, I mean, as, this town has an amazing history for, you know, not being a huge town, having one of the most famous actresses of all time, one of the most famous comedians of all time, being Jonathan Winters, one of the most famous musicians, John Legend, and of course, one of the greatest boxers, Davey Moore. Let's go visit my family back at home. Their home, not my home. Look at that rose. Hello, downtown Troy. Hello, Old Mayflower Theater. Now I'm back and look. I don't think he's going to chase you back. Not this time. <laughs> 